No, I mean, oh, give it a couple years. It'll change. Yeah, I was just waiting to turn it on. Huh? No. No, it's already, I've already logged back in. Yeah. Yeah. It made me, it made me log back in at 10 o'clock. Uh, no, it kicked, it kicked it out at 10. Uh, and then it made me re, to sign in at 10 o'clock, so. Yeah. Where did that come from? We can only hope so. So we got folks on online. Oh, Jeffrey's on there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good. Good deal. Oh. What a Paducah night. Paducah? Paducah? Paduconian? There. Paduconian. Yeah, it's, it's all the same. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <coughs> uh, Paducian? Maybe. Maybe. Um, <coughs> trying to think. I... I don't think there's a way that we can do. So Wednesday night, there was a lady who can't hear, was watching. Are you, are you serious? Are we, can you hear us? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. No, she's laughing at you. Well, obviously, she can hear us. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. So anyway, she's laughing at you. I am. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. But you don't know. Well, you didn't know. You didn't know. You didn't know. You didn't know. Now we do. Now we do. Um, I've never seen her on before, and I've seen a lot of posts from her recently. Um, but I don't know of a way to do closed captioning. I have. I've seen her on there, but... Um, I don't know if there's a way to do closed captioning on Facebook or even with that program that we're using. So YouTube, YouTube will do it, but it's really bad. Yeah. It's not e like the majority of the words aren't even the words that people say. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because I've not found anything that would actually do closed captioning for it. Um, and I forget the other lady's name. Christine. Christine. Yeah. Um, like she said, nobody can type that fast to keep up with the normal speech to be able to do that. But I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a there's there's an option. That could be if we knew somebody that could sign language with that program that we're using, we can have multiple cameras from phones using that program. So I don't know if that's something you might want to. Yeah. There, there's a couple people that's mentioned that they. Yeah, I do. Yeah, no, I do. Um, He's one of them. There's a couple other people that's mentioned they wish that people would do sign language or closed captioning on their videos, but, I mean, if it's not available, it's not available. So, I don't know. <coughs> we don't know sign language enough to be able to do that. Um, oh, yeah, without a doubt. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I 
think I, I think I felt that one too. Um, but I don't know. I, something to think about for the future. Really. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if we'll see if she shows up again. <clears throat> um, to be able to at least post the verses or something. So, and kind of the main context at it. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. And uh, Bluegrass Bible Conference, June 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Uh, go to the website, register. That way we'll know everybody's who all is coming and uh, all that fun stuff. Something else I was going to say about that, and I can't remember what it was. I don't know. I'll think of it. Maybe that was what it was. Go online and register for it so we'll know how many people's here. And if you do, for those that are watching, if you call the hotel, uh, make sure you mention it's for the conference. That way you get that rate. It's not a great discount, but it's cheaper than everywhere else around here. I don't know. The other side of town might have some cheaper. I don't know. I'd say so. Yeah, there is a pool um, yeah, inside. Slash, slash baptistry. <laughs> slash baptistry, yeah. <clears throat> we'll do, uh, yeah, in the morning. Um, I'm thinking that's it, though. I just want to talk about that. All right. <clears throat> Bless you. Nah, I waited that time. All right, Romans chapter 11, and we'll get started. Did anybody leave us yet? <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11. Um, we're working our way through this. We'll start off in verse 7, read down through verse 10, and <clears throat> we'll get started with uh, verse 7. Talking about the blindness of Israel. <clears throat> I went ahead just to keep it somewhat clean. I went ahead and drew that up. That way I'm not trying to write and say things at the same time and write even more illegibly, but I think that's a little bit better than normal. It's just a little low. I could have it up higher. It'd be... It's all good, though. Um, <clears throat> we'll start in verse 7 and read down through verse 10. And then we'll get started. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see and bow down their back always. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we come to scripture today with the idea that we're going to allow your words to speak for itself. We're not going to place anything that we already believe into what your Bible says, but we actually might change what we believe or how we operate based on what your Bible and what your word actually says, <clears throat> that we might be able to have a clear idea of how to present the gospel to a lost and dying world, that we may be able to glorify you and your son, not just in the ages to come, but today as well. And we thank you for this day, we thank you for your word, and we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, as we take a look, <clears throat> verse 7, notice we get down, uh, we, we've talked about all the things that's been taking place uh, a little bit later on. In verse 11, if you look down at verse 11, Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled? Notice where he says, I say then, right? There's there's something based on what he's just out through talking about. He says, so I, I say then, because of what I just got through saying, what we're going to talk about today, have they stumbled that they should, that they should fall, God forbid. 
but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So when we take a look at this, there is a time when they stumble but do not fall, but then there is also a time when they do fall. And then we see as we go on down through there, uh, he says, For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So we have this time period uh, in which they diminish from their status. All right? And that's what, that's what Paul's dealing with here in verses 8 and 9 specifically is their status. All right? um, but verse 7 is the thing that I want to make sure that we get today because I want to make sure that we understand that because where he says in verse 11, I say then, well, that means we need to know what's going on in the verses prior to that. Now, <clears throat> remember, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 is a section together that's telling us this is what's going on with Israel at this particular time in the dispensation of the grace of God. Right? We've looked at Romans chapter 9 really gives us the idea of Israel's past. Romans chapter 10 gives us an idea of, of Israel's present. And Romans chapter 11 really gives us an idea of Israel's future. And we've got to keep that stuff in mind because that's, that's one of those issues that we're going to, live, that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, we've talked about, <clears throat> if you look at verse, verse 1 of Romans chapter 11, verse 1, and I know we've been through this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but <clears throat> the whole basis of denominationalism, the whole basis of covenant theology, the whole basis of Calvinism and Arminianism, and I've said this before, the, the foundation of all those things <clears throat> is a misinterpretation of Romans chapter 11. Okay. And we'll see that as we go through here. And there's some other things that we'll have to deal with as well. But notice in verse 1 he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am not, uh, for I am also, I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying... And we looked at that, and we got down through there, and we noticed in verse 4, it says, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed my knee to the image of Baal. Now that's, when we, when we went back last week and looked at, when he's talking to Elijah, he's saying at that time there were 7,000 people that God said, I've, that, that, that actually have believed my word, right? And so, what he's talking about, he's saying the same thing is taking place today in verse 5. Even so, then, now, at this present time. So you've got to think about when is that present time. Is he talking about right now, today, in, in 2018? The answer is no. What he's talking about is when he wrote this book around Acts chapter 19 or 20, uh, right around in that time, he's saying at that particular time, this group is still here. He says, Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And we got, we got through, we went through uh, Luke chapter 12, and, and we, we, we went back to where Moses was showing the nation of Israel that they were going to be provoked to emulation or to jealousy by that group, which Jesus Christ calls the little flock. Right? Now, <clears throat> when you think about... When you think about what's going on, go back to uh, Romans chapter 9 real quick. And this should make this make a little bit more sense, perhaps. Romans chapter 9, and we've mentioned this before, um, but it bears repeating. Romans chapter 9, verse 6, notice he says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. The issue there is it's not God's word that's the problem, Right? It's the people. And what do we know over in chapter 10? He says they did this ignorantly in unbelief because they were going about trying to establish their own righteousness rather than getting their righteousness by faith through God. All right, so Romans, Romans chapter 9, verse 6. He says, For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So that's what he's talking about here is dealing with the fact that just because they are descendants, physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't mean that they're all Israel, right? And so then what we've got is 
what's, what's taking place is there's a group of people, that remnant, a small group of people out of the whole who when they believe, and it actually took place before the death of Christ, but when we see that that small group of people, everybody, when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they became part of that little flock. All right? That's that remnant that he's talking about in Romans chapter 11. And he's saying, at this time, there is still a remnant. Go back to Romans chapter 11. He says there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of other things, and we, we've kind of already, we've gone over that anyway. There's a whole lot of misconceptions about what he means, because what do we know about today, the church, the body of Christ, in this dispensation of grace people say well that's the same thing the grace that he's talking about in all of his epistles is the same grace that Paul is talking about in here in Romans chapter 11 the answer to that question is no it's a different thing <clears throat> rather than bringing wrath upon the entire nation of Israel what did God do he gave them an opportunity something that they didn't that they shouldn't have gotten but he showed them grace and said if you believe on my, Lord, on my son Jesus Christ and are baptized and all this other stuff, they're going to become part of that little flock. All right? And then the election part, we've already talked about that. The election part isn't it, that God before the foundation of the world said, I'm going to pick you out and I'm going to put you in the little flock. And I'm going to pick you out and I'm going to put you in the little flock. All right? They have a choice to get in it or not. We've talked about that before. But as we take a look, keep on going. Notice verse 6, he says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Then we get to the text that we're dealing with. What then? Based on that, <clears throat> based on that, here's my question, Paul. And Paul's, what Paul's doing is he's thinking of objections that people are going to have. And he's dealing with the objections right off the bat because he knows that they're going to have them, right? And so he says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. And what happened to the rest of them? And the rest were blinded. Right? Notice, it doesn't say that they were blind. Something took place that blinded the rest of the nation of Israel. Okay? So let's take a look at this real quick. Um, and I did misspeak last week. Go to Acts chapter 13. I did misspeak last week. <clears throat> I had it backwards. Uh, I said that Paul healed a blind person, but no, it's actually Paul blinds a Jew is what it is. I misspoke when I said that. Uh, but we'll clean that up today. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, <clears throat> Start off. we'll just start off in verse 1. Um, <clears throat> there's something that takes place here, and we've already, we've already looked at the fact, <clears throat> Acts chapter 9, Saul gets saved, all right? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that for just a second. Keep that in mind, though. Acts chapter 9, Saul gets saved. We talked about that there was an unprophesied return of Jesus Christ to the earth where he didn't touch the ground. He spoke to Saul, and you got the salvation of Saul in Acts chapter 9. And then Jesus Christ talks to Ananias, right? And says, Saul's going to come and he's going to talk to you, and I want you to tell him that I've got work for him to go to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the uh, nation of Israel, right? So then we get down to Acts chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Notice. Now there were in the, in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that are, called, uh, that are called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. <clears throat> you know, I've, I've often found it curious. I'm not sure how to answer that. I wonder why Saul was the last one mentioned. This is just a curious observation that I don't really have an answer for. It's just something I've kind of 
kept in the back of my mind. I wonder if there's a reason why he was kept last. Uh, as verse 2 continues, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. All right? So <clears throat> Acts chapter 13, right in here, the Holy Spirit calls out Barnabas and Saul. Now notice, <clears throat> his name's still Saul, right? Okay, keep on going. <clears throat> Verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, there's a few things <clears throat> that we need to, to, to pick up here. First of all, what do we find out? He is a certain sorcerer, right? He is a false prophet. Notice they slip in that he was a Jew, and his name was Bar-Jesus. Uh, Bar-Jesus, that name means the son of, or son of Jehovah Savior. Well... <clears throat> There's, there's a whole bunch of things we could take with that. On In Acts chapter 13, Saul and Barnabas and Saul is dealing with a Jew who is a false prophet, and his name means son of Jehovah Savior. Now when we think about that, that couldn't be more representative of that group of people than anybody else I could know of. You have down here unbelieving Israel. They, they. There's a few other things we'll get to a little bit later on. They, they're blinded now, right? There's a blinding that had taken place with that group of people, and so now, and that's this is exactly what's going to take place. Notice in verse seven, which was the deputy of the county, Sergius Paulus a prudent man who is called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So we have Sergius Paulus desires to hear this. But Elimaeus, the sorcerer, now we've got a name for him, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, notice, who also is called Paul. By the way, right there, is his name changed to Paul? No. It says his name is Saul, notice, who is also called Paul. So a couple things real quick. Saul and Paul. Saul is the what? Hebrew name. Paul is the... Oops. It's his Gentile name. What do we know about Paul? He is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says this a whole bunch of times. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, all that stuff, right? <clears throat> Paul was a Hebrew and a Gentile, a Jew and a Gentile, in one body. All right? He goes by Saul as a Hebrew, and notice it says, who is also called Paul, that's his Greek or his Gentile name. Now, here's what's really, what I think is really fascinating about this. Do you know what one of the definitions for Paul's name is? Pause. Do you know what took place with the prophetic program when God saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus? He put the he hit the pause button on that prophetic program. I think it's kind of interesting that he just happens to bring up says his name's also Paul. He was also called Paul, and one of the definitions for his name is pause. The one that everybody goes with is little one. That's the definition that most Christian uses. 
<clears throat> Why? I'm not sure. They say that Paul was a really short person. I don't know of any reason why you would think that. The only reason they do is because that right there. But one of the definitions is pause. The definition. It's just the definition of his name. If you look up the definition of it. Um, one of the definitions that you have is, is pause. Um, now, the really, the really that, that's one of those really interesting things. It's just kind of an extra piece of information. Does it really mean anything? Maybe not. But I think it's kind of neat that, that that we have that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff we can get into that. But notice, <clears throat> so we've got, who is it? Go back up. We've got a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, uh, whose name is Bar-Jesus. So we've got a sorcerer and a false prophet, right? We find out the sorcerer's name is Elimaeus, all right? Uh, for so is his name by interpretation. What's his, what, what Elimaeus means is the knowing one. Notice it says, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, all right? So we have a sorcerer and a Jew trying to prevent uh, Sergius Paulus, notice it says that he was a prudent man. He actually called for Barnabas and Saul to come to him. And what this Jew and the sorcerer are doing is what? Trying to prevent this guy from hearing the faith. They're trying to prevent him from hearing the faith. Why? <clears throat> Part of that blinded group of people. And we'll see exactly what takes place right here. Notice. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, talking about the sorcerer, and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? All right. There's a couple things with that. We've looked at this before. Remember when we talked about the simplicity of Christ and how people will subtly change things and make it no longer simple. Well, that took place way back in Genesis chapter 3. Right? Paul tells us that Satan was subtle in all of his ways and so much so that he was able to trick Eve and Eve was able to go and trick Adam based on the false information that she had actually received. So it actually took place way back here in Genesis chapter 3. And we see that throughout history, over and over and over again, so much so that we even see it here. Notice he says, and said, verse 10, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of God? Are you going to continue doing this and changing the way that God's supposed to be doing things, the way that God wants to be doing things? Are you going to pervert God's word? That's what he's saying. What do we know? Way back in, in Genesis chapter 3, bless you, through Satan's subtlety, what did he do? First thing he was, he questioned God's word and says, Yea, hath God said. Are you sure this is what God said? He questions God's word. Next, what takes place is you have an adding to, a taking from, a watering down, and then a complete denial of God. The way Satan works is those five things, he's trying to destroy the book that we have in front of us. And he's doing a bang-up job right now. He's, he started back then, and he's doing a bang-up job even today. And that's exactly what's going on here. How do you pervert something? You change something by adding something to it. And that's what Paul talks about. When people pervert the gospel of Christ, when we take a look at the dispensation of the grace of God and we say the reason that Jesus Christ died was because he died for our sins. He was buried so he would be able to take those sins away so that they couldn't be brought up again. And then he raised again three days later for our justification that we might have justification, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel. How do we pervert the gospel? 
Well, now you have to go to church every Sunday. You just added something to it. You've changed the gospel by adding something to it. It's a slight change, but it's a change nonetheless. Well, you have to start tithing because I need a jet so I can fly all over the country and the world to be able to preach this false gospel. You know, there's a there's a girl that came up to me the other day, and I kind of feel bad sometimes. Uh, they were selling smoked meats to uh, pay for their uh, mission trip. Your church doesn't preach the gospel right. Why would I? Why would I give money to send you somewhere to preach a false gospel? That seems kind of harsh, maybe, but I mean, how can I? How can I, in good conscience, give money to a group of people that I know is not preaching the right gospel? It makes a difference. But I mean, <clears throat> subtle changes. It's been going on since day, I was going to say day one, but I guess it was probably before day one, or maybe after day seven, depends on where you think Satan fell. Um, but all the way back in Genesis chapter three, we see Satan works subtly, and the way that he does that is he perverts the right ways of the Lord. Verse 11. And now, behold, the, land, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, notice, and thou shalt be blind. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to this sorcerer, he's speaking to, these Jew, to the Jew, and he says, you're going to be blind. Notice. <clears throat> Not seeing for a season. So are they going to be blinded forever? The answer is no. It's for a season. How long is that season? Well, we don't know yet. Right? We know that it's at least, what, 1900 and almost 2000 years now? That that's been taking place. Notice, and immediately, by the way, you see where it says, and immediately, did, 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 did Barnabas and Saul have to give a tithe for this miracle to happen? Did Barnabas and Saul have to wait on God's timing for this miracle to happen? What's it say? Immediately. There are people who teach that God wants to give you a miracle, but the reason it's not happened is it's not his timing. You've not prayed enough. You've not asked for forgiveness enough, which you don't need to now. You have not given enough money. You've not shown and sowed your seed of faith to prove that you're going to believe God's word. And the only way that he's going to do that miracle for you is if you... Now, you're, you're going to tell me that somebody has enough faith to move Jesus Christ out of heaven into their heart and into their life, but they don't have enough to believe in... It. When God works, it's immediate. It was an immediate thing that took place. All right. Notice. <clears throat> Verse 11. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So we see what's going on here. He blinds and then does what? Guys walking around, groping around, hoping somebody could lead him. Go over to Acts 15 real quick. <clears throat> Acts 
Acts chapter 15 is shortly after Acts 13, right? Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, Paul writes an entire book about what took place in Acts chapter 15. The book of Galatians, Paul is laying out for us what took place in Acts chapter 15. Notice, there is some sort of understanding of what's going on here. What's Galatians about? Galatians is about somebody coming in, Jews coming in to the, to the folks of the church in Galatia and say, we've heard that you've been saved, but you need to be circumcised because if you're not circumcised, you're not fulfilling the law. And Paul gets upset at that. Why? Because you're not supposed to do that today. That's not part of the program today, right? So that's what was going on. Peter and the 11, they were doing this and they weren't supposed to, but notice... He does know something correctly. Go down to chapter 15, um, verse verse 9. So Peter's learned some things. He's figured it out. Verse 7, it says, And there had been much disputing. Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. This is before Paul and Paul and Peter have their little argument. In actually in, in Galatians, we find out what Peter said. Peter and Paul they give each other right hands of fellowship. Paul says, "You're going to go to the circumcision, which is the Jews only," and he says, "We're going to go to the heathen." Right. So this is before they talk about that. Uh, keep on going. Drop down to verse nine. <clears throat> Verse 9, and put no difference between us and them. Between them and the, uh, between us, when he says us, he's talking about the nation of Israel. When he's talking about them, he's talking about the Gentiles in the context, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Well, isn't Peter, if he says you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved, Isn't he also putting a yoke on people of something that they don't have to do? And that's what Paul goes to him and says, you're trying to make these people do stuff that you can't do. And so he's learning some stuff here. Notice, but we believe that through grace, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, we shall be saved, what? Even as they. Do you know what Peter found out? Paul's preaching the gospel that also includes all those unbelieving people there. And what he's saying is, you all, Israel, you need to go and get saved just like the Gentiles are. He's learning something. And he knows that what they're doing is out of commission. That God's put the pause on it two chapters earlier, about a year or two earlier. Yeah, about two years earlier. He figures that out. He learns something. By the way, go over to Galatians real quick. Go over to Galatians chapter 2. This is is Paul talking about what's going on between them two back here. Galatians chapter 2, verse, verse, start in verse 1. Notice he says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel, that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest, any means, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now he's talking about the the people of reputation. He's talking about is Peter and the eleven. 
Verse 4, he says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in. So you have people that didn't know bring in false teachers uh, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So you have people here that are the false brethren. They're going in saying, hey, you all need to be like us and be saved like we are. Okay? They're saying, hey, Gentiles, you all need to be saved like us. You need to be circumcised the same way that we're circumcised. And Paul is saying, you have people here in, in Acts chapter 15 in Galatia. They don't know that these people are teaching a false doctrine. Right? And that's what he's talking about. So these people who are unaware bring in false doctrine and false teachers. Verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection, no. Paul's saying, I'm not going to give you a chance. Not even, not for an hour. I'm not even going to give you even an hour to talk to the folks in Galatia. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Here's, here's, here's what I find extremely important. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, but of these who seem to be somewhat. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. He's saying the people who thought they were big and mighty, he's like, you thought they were something? I don't care who it is. Notice. For they who seem to be somewhat, notice, in conference, that's that where he's saying privately he spoke to them up in verse 2. Notice, added nothing to me. What's he saying? They were talking and teaching things I already knew. They added nothing to me. Notice how the next verse starts off. But contrary wise, what's that mean? They're going to learn something from me. Why? Because I've got something that they've never heard before. Notice, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter... How is it that Peter got that, circ that circumcision gospel? Well, Jesus Christ taught it to him. He was a fisherman. He wasn't a theologian. He was a fisherman. And Jesus Christ taught him that gospel, the circumcision. And, and he said, the same way that he got it, I got the gospel, the uncircumcision, the exact same way. Now, what do we notice there? There is a gospel of the uncircumcision and a gospel of the circumcision. Those are two different things, right? What some, what some Bibles do is they change that word. Notice where it says the gospel of. They change that word of to to. Now I want you to think about this for a second. If I have the gospel to the circumcision and the gospel to the uncircumcision, I have one gospel going to two different people, right? But if I have the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision, those are two different gospels for two different people. Does that make sense? You see how subtle, just changing one word of to two, changes the whole thing. What he's saying here is, I've got a gospel that's different than what Peter taught. If we go back to Acts chapter 2, when Peter's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection, does he ever mention that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the three, three days later? The answer is no. When he presents that, that truth to them, the death, burial, and resurrection, he says, you're the ones that killed him. You're the ones that buried him. But God rose him up because he's going to sit him on a throne on his right hand 
And he's going to sit there until God makes his foes his footstool when he comes down and they know exactly what he's talking about. When he comes down, he sets foot on Mount Olives. I said it again, didn't I? Did I say it right that time? Yeah. Yeah. thought I messed up again. Mount of Olives. That's different than Paul saying, it's by grace through faith you're saved because Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again three days later. By the way, when they when they took Jesus Christ before the before the nation of Israel, what did they say? Crucify him. Let his blood be on our hands. What did Christ do when he's on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Can you imagine that? In the middle of being tortured and hanging there by the hands of your family and friends, and his response was, forgive them. Hmm. Notice, as we come down through here, Verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Notice, And when James, Cephas, and John, Cephas is Peter, James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. It's over in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. They gave to me and Barnabas the right, hand, the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. And from that point on, you don't see Peter show up in the book of Acts. Why? Because the program's changing. Israel's diminishing. What is it that they're called from that point on? That that unbelieving nation of Israel, do you know, who, do you know what they're called now? Right there it tells us they're also called the heathen. Because what does Paul do? Two chapters later, he goes into a Jewish synagogue why? Because that's part of what we're dealing with in Romans chapter 11. All these, all these people down here, including all the Gentiles. I didn't put a whole bunch of X's for Gentiles. Just picture there's a whole bunch of X's down here. All right. And so what happens is Paul preaches to this Jew. He believes it. He gets placed into the church of the body of Christ. Paul preaches to this Gentile. He believes it. Gets placed into the church of the body of Christ. Paul preaches to this Jew. She goes in. She believes it. She becomes a member of the church of the body of Christ. Paul preaches to this Gentile. She believes it. She comes in to be a member of the church of the body of Christ. And from that point on, from chapter 15 on, you don't see Peter again. After that time. Why? Because he's saying... Um, <clears throat> You remember, you all remember when Jesus Christ, he's talking to the twelve. He says to Peter, which is one of the most misunderstood passages, he says, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter was not the first pope. I hate to break it to anybody. I know, I know, I know. As your Catholic high school background, unfortunately, you're on. You're Peter was not the first pope. Peter never went to Rome. Peter never got out of Jerusalem. What do you think of that? You know why? Because he gave to, to, to Paul and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, said, we're going to go to the nation of Israel. Do you know where they were? In Jerusalem. Do you know what the Great Commission was? Jesus Christ says, go to Jerusalem then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. And you know what he says? You're not going to get over Jerusalem before I come back. Jesus Christ should have come back right there at the end of Acts chapter 7. They were still in Jerusalem. They never got out of it. They never got to Judea. They never got to Samaria. And they definitely didn't get to the uttermost parts of the world. And you know why? Because Peter right here... In Acts chapter 15, 
uses the keys of the kingdom. Jesus Christ tells the Peter, he says, everything you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Everything you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When they gave Peter, or when they gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship and said, we're going to the circumcision, you're all going to go to the heathen, they loosed themselves from that great commission that churches today are trying to do. And if Peter, the guy that the, the, the commission was given to, says he's done with it, then you can't pick it up. The problem is, is people don't realize that this gospel back here doesn't save. This gospel up here does. This commission back here doesn't do anything, but this commission up here does. Our commission is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. Not disciples, but ambassadors. God's making ambassadors today, not disciples. There's a difference there. Disciples are people that, that learn from Jesus Christ and they were able to go and teach that stuff. An ambassador is a person who is not living in the place that they're actually dwelling. Where's our home? Our home is in heaven. We're, we're, we're foreigners on this earth. We're representing Jesus Christ who is in heaven. We're representing a foreign dignitary, a king, on this earth. That's what an ambassador is. And we're supposed to go and tell these people, you need to be reconciled. Why? Because you've not been reconciled yet. God's doing it right now. He's participating in reconciling people. Go back to Romans chapter 11 real quick, because we'll talk about this coming up soon. Romans chapter 11. What he's talking about is we have a mission. We have a ministry that we're supposed to take this gospel to the world. Not this gospel back here because this gospel back here has us speaking in tongues. This gospel back here has us playing with snakes. This gospel back here has us drinking any deadly thing. Do you know why they're going to be able to drink deadly things and not die? Because the water during the tribulation period is going to be so... It's just, it's going to be junk. It's going to be so contaminated full of junk, they're not going to be able to drink it, but God's going to give them a, an ability to drink nasty water and not die. They're going to be able to pick up snakes, not like they do in eastern and southern Kentucky and, and northern Tennessee and stuff like that, not the snake handling stuff. They're going to be, if, if they get bit by a snake, God's going to supernaturally heal them and they're not going to die. Yeah. There's a reason. Well, here's the thing, though. Satan is what? Satan, Satan, Satan's, Satan is what? He's the serpent, right? We go back. We go back in Genesis chapter three. He's a, he's the serpent. We go out in, Gen, in in Revelation. That's exactly what it is. What he's talking about there. Um, Satan. It says that Satan goes about like a roaring lion, right? seeking whom he may devour. You're going to have people out here that are going to have to deal with things that you and I can't even imagine right now. One of those, I mean, you can go through <coughs> Paul. Paul reaches into Paul reaches into a fire and gets bit by a snake, right? He shakes it off and he doesn't die. Do you know what that was proof of? There's Jews and Gentiles over here in the Church of the Body of Christ with your old toys. Why? To provoke them to jealousy. To provoke them to emulation. To say, you need to start acting like these people down here. Why? Because God said you're the same now. The problem with churches today is we've got to go and act like these people up here. And if they couldn't do it, what in the world do you think that you can? But what God's saying today is, I want everybody to know I've declared everybody under sin and you need to come to me and my son and what he did on the cross and that's the issue. 
we can't go do the stuff that they were doing up there because they didn't do it. God's already said, you can't do it. By the way, that little flock over here, um, the 1,400 people over there, that's going to be the, the new little flock. Um, by the way, that's not Latter-day Saints people, even though they they claim to be. Or the 144,000. I don't know why I said 1,400. 144. No, you weren't. I'm just joking. I don't know why I said 1,400. A whole bunch of people. Huh? There is a TV show. And I think that's where I got it from. Yeah. Um, but you have 144,000. That's going to be your little flock. They're going to do what the little flock started to do over here. All right. Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 15. <clears throat> we'll get to the blinding stuff a little bit more. <laughs> well, we're getting there. Huh? I know, I have, but... Um, Romans chapter 11, verse 15. <clears throat> For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead. If God casts them away for the reconciling of the world, what does it mean to reconcile the world? You're changing your status from, a, from an enemy to God to a person that God can actually deal with. That's what reconciliation means. To reconcile is to change the status of something. That's what he's doing. He changes the status of the world from unsavable too savable. By the way, nation of Israel, Jesus Christ says, you can blaspheme the, the Son of God and it will be forgiven you, but you blaspheme the Holy Ghost and it won't be forgiven. We've talked about this before. Acts chapter 7, what do they do? They blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They're unsavable according to this gospel. Had it not been for this new gospel, they wouldn't be savable. He's reconciled Israel to a point where he can actually save them. Because under that program, they can't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, you're fine. Um, go get Second Samuel real quick and I'll answer that question. Yeah, I know. It's right after 1 Samuel. You're welcome. Now everybody knows where it is. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Here's the thing. Has God changed the status of the world? Are they now in a position where they can be saved? Yeah. Yeah. There's four types of reconciliation. That's what... No, you... There's a lot of people that's missing stuff. There's a lot of people that are teaching reconciliation means that God's forgiven people their sins, and that's not what it's talking about. There's four different types of reconciliation in the Bible. So we'll talk about that next week, I guess. No, we'll talk about we'll talk about that when we get to verse 15, huh? The reconciling of the world, or when we do that? Yeah. That's individual reconciliation. God's reconciled the world saying that you're savable. But you need to make a choice to be reconciled to God and then trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then you individually become reconciled. That's one of the four types of reconciliation. The other is going to be reconciliation between Jew and Gentile, which is also part of Paul's gospel. And then there's also a reconciliation of the heaven and the earth. Just because the Bible says a word doesn't mean that it means what you want it to mean all the time. And so when, when somebody comes along and they read 2 Corinthians 15 and they see reconciliation, it's just like when the Baptists see baptism and say, Water! You have to know the context. And people miss the context. And it's just the same thing that just because you see reconciliation doesn't mean You've been forgiven of all your sins. That means you've, your status has been changed. In fact, when, when God talks about the reconciliation of the heaven and the earth, it's a different Greek word. That means it's going to be reconciled in two ways. Not just one. 
So, I mean, even within those four reconciliations, it just, there's so much, there's so much that people, we just don't know yet. And it's amazing when you actually learn it, then it starts making sense for the rest, I mean, everything else starts to make sense. Um, but that, that's, that, to answer that question, that's what it is. That it's personal, individual reconciliation that you have to be, um, and that's the issue that we're dealing with today. Um, Well, we know Saul was, um, but yeah, I, I, I've thought about that too. But then again, you know, it's one of those things. <clears throat> Paul himself says he was a blasphemer, but it does, he doesn't say that he blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And there's a lot of people that say that he did because he stoned Stephen. He didn't stone Stephen. He was holding the coats of the people that were stoning Stephen. Um, so a lot of people say Paul couldn't be saved under that program because he blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I don't know if he actually did. There's not there's not scripture that proves it. He was there and he was holding the coats and he had the people do that, but I don't know. Maybe maybe he is just like just like David just like David was guilty of murder when he had relations with Bathsheba, he sent her husband out to the front lines of war to have him killed, I guess it might be the same thing. Accessory to the murder, maybe? I don't know. But, I mean, it's it could be that same situation. But I don't know if there's actually a verse or anything that says that he blasphemed the Holy Ghost. But it's possible through through that line. But um, <clears throat> So we get 2 Samuel 5. Everybody get there safely. Everybody arrived safely. Stayed under the speed limit. Maybe, maybe check Google Maps. Table of contents. That's okay. I'll do that sometimes too. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Start in verse 6. <clears throat> David... If, if you look at verse 1, it says, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, why are thy bone, where we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul, which is not Paul, by the way, was king over us, thou wast, uh, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel, and the, and, Lord's, and the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king of Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron. And so we see, this is where we are in, in the context. David is the king at this time. He was, been, he was 30 years old. You see in verse 4, when he was 30 years old, uh, when he began to reign. I mean, could you imagine that at 30 years old, being a king over the nation of Israel? It is. It is an interesting number. Um, when did Jesus Christ start his earthly ministry? At the age of 30. It's kind of neat, right? Anyway, keep on going. Um, notice in verse 5 it says, In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. So he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. What what was Jesus Christ when he died? 33. All the numbers, yeah, probably. The the numbers there, the 30 and the 3, all that stuff, numerology stuff, I find that extremely, yeah, extremely interesting. It all means something, yeah. Um. So we see we see these things in verse six. Notice he says, "And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither 
thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain, whereof they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. What's he talking about here? That's a, that's a picture of these people up here. If you're blinded, where are you not going to be? In that kingdom. These people were cut off from that kingdom. David is the king of that kingdom. That is what he's talking about. That's why when we talk about that the kingdom is a literal, visible, physical, earthly, Davidic kingdom vested in the nation of Israel. On earth, and the city of Jerusalem is going to be the center of that. You know, when when people look at, this is going to be a crude drawing, but when people look at Israel, they look at like that little sliver of land. They think that's Israel's land. When you've got, that's what Israel's going to have compared to where they are right now. What everybody says is what, the, what belongs to Israel. There's a whole, there's a whole thing out there that's going to be Israel's. And Jerusalem's going to be the center of that. And Christ is going to have a throne in the center of that city. That city's going to have, it's got measurements to it. It's got 12 tribes. It's got 12 gates. It's not just going to be, I mean, you think the Twin Towers was a marvel of construction and the pyramids and all this stuff. Just wait. Wait until that city's here. And people think it's just in your heart. It's got a place on earth. God promised a piece of land to Abraham and said, your people, your seed are going to live here. It's not in your heart. It's a physical piece of land. And the blind are not going to go into it. Get, uh, <clears throat> we get Psalm 149, 146, my bad. Psalm 146. <clears throat> Start off in verse. Uh, start off in verse one. <clears throat> praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord? I will sing praises unto my God while I have, while, while I have any any being. Put not your trust in princes. Throwing the word government there. <laughs> if we put if we put our trust in any person, in any position of authority on this earth, shame on us. If we expect other people to look out for us, they're not. Anyway. Nor of the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to, to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. By the way, that's as political as I'll ever get. I'm never going to, I would never, that, that's as close as I would get. I'm not going to, I would never use this platform to, to push any agenda like that. That's just, where's our hope? Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in his death, burial, and resurrection and the catching away of, and the changing of this vile body into a body that's likened and fashioned like unto his, that we go and live in his government and perform his work. That's as, that'll be as political as I'd ever get. Verse 5. Happy is he that hath God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that, there is, that, that therein is, which keepeth truth forever 
which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. Notice, the Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. And the Lord loveth the righteousness, righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth us upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Do you know when that verse is going to take place? Right out here in the kingdom. Go over. There's some other ones I'd, I'd like to get to, but um, I want you all to see this. I mean, we had um, Job and Isaiah... Uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Zephaniah. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real book, Mike. Malachi or Malachi, the Italian proverb. Malachi. Malachi. Um, get, uh, get. So what you're saying is politics is out, but bad jokes is wide open. Oh, wide open. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. What's wrong with that joke? You like that one? Alex yeah, that was Alex Curtis' joke. Oh, Malachi. I see. I see where it is. I see what you did there. All right. Um, get uh, get Matthew chapter eleven. <clears throat> oh. Um, on your way there, grab Matthew chapter 9. <laughs> That's like uh, when we were down in La Follette two years ago, I think, maybe. Um, I said, let's go to the book of Jeremiah. And I, and I said, if you're not sure which ones, it's the ones that are wet because he was the weeping prophet. Brother Jordan's like, That's not a good one. In the middle of me speaking, I was like, well, eh, you know, I'm around kids all day. I'm allowed to have bad jokes. They tell me I've got really good dad jokes. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it's really not. All right. Yeah. Who knows? It, yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 Well, 99% of the jokes you think is funny are not. All right, 98, my bad. <laughs> or, yeah, well, I can see that, though. He, he enjoys those, so that's why. Yeah. I know, that's the funny thing. 150 kids. Yeah, yeah my kids asked me, I was like, do you have any kids? I was like, 150 of them. <laughs> yeah, and you're, yeah, 150 different ones every year, and you all are killing me. The only good thing is, the bad thing is, I can't claim them on taxes. The good thing is, I don't have to pay for insurance and all that. Anyway, Matthew chapter nine. Verse, verse. We'll start in verse 27. <clears throat> This is, this is right on the heels. Jesus is, is answering some questions that the Pharisees give him. Um, verse 18, he heals um, a woman of an issue, a blood issue. We get down to verse 27. Notice, and when Jesus departed thence, so after he, after he heals, heals the woman with the blood issue and then raises the daughter of, of the ruler, verse 27 says, and when Jesus departed thence, Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man knoweth know it. So what's he do? 
He heals two blind men. Notice, what does he say? What's the stipulation on this? Notice. Uh, verse 29. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. Now, what most people say is, if you believe in it, God's going to do it. And if you're wavering, then God's not. And it's, it's his time. And if you're believing, right? What is it that they said? They said what? Yes, we do believe that you can do this. Where is their faith? In him. And they, he said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes. If they truly believed it, then what was going to happen? They get, they get healed. If they didn't believe that, then what was going to happen? They weren't going to be healed. That's why he said, it's according to your faith. What is it that you're believing? They know that back here, when we looked at the verses and we skipped a whole bunch of them, they know that back here what was going to take place is these blind people weren't going to be able to get in, and the only way that I can get in is how? If I'm no longer blind. So what do they do? They go to him and say, heal us. Now, here's the bad thing. Keep on going. <clears throat> What's he say? Verse 30, at the end, he says, he charges them and says, see that no man know it. Why do you think that Jesus Christ would have said, don't go tell people that you've been healed? Well, not only that, but what, what, was, what was the basis of their faith? what he said, right? And then it's his word is what he's talking about. What is it that everybody else is going to believe is going to be based on what? What they say. That's the issue, right? Keep on going. Notice. What was their response? But they, when they were departed, spread abroad. <laughs> his... It just... All right, all right. Don't go tell anybody. Hey, guess what? This guy over here, he's healing blind people. That's exactly what they did. Notice, they spread abroad his fame. Where? In all that country. He said, don't go tell people. Which, I mean, if I'm blind... That was my. That was going to be my next question. Why? Why was it that they believed the word enough that they would get healed, but then he wouldn't? They wouldn't trust him. Isn't that what Israel did the whole time? Isn't that how people do today? Yeah, you get a. People want to be saved from circumstances, not from their sin. And as soon as they get out of a circumstance, they say, "God got me through this circumstance." And then I'm going to go do whatever I want to again until I get into another bad circumstance. And then it's, oh, oh God, I won't do, and I'll go to church every Sunday. And as soon as something goes through, they're like, well, God got me through that, so I'm going to get. That's exactly what Israel did that all the time, right? Chapter 11. <clears throat> Um, start off in <clears throat> start off in verse 1 <clears throat> and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ he sent two of his disciples and said unto him art thou he that should come or do we look for another What's he saying? Are you the one that the scriptures were talking about? Or is it somebody else? All right? Keep on going. Is, is, his, is his faith wavering? Does he believe, is he believing the scriptures and the verses? Or is he not? Notice. Keep on going. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and shew John again those things which ye do hear and see. Now this is different. What's he saying? Go and tell them the stuff that you hear and see. 
What are they hearing and seeing? Huh? So then, when we take a look at that, what is it that they're... they're he's saying, take it back to him. Notice in verse 5. The blind receive their sight. Why? You know, there's a, there's there's Old Testament scriptures, and we, we skipped a bunch of them, that talks about that he's going to do that. Right? Notice. And the lame shall walk. The lepers are clean, cleansed. And the deaf hear... The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went out for you to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went out ye for to see? Notice he, answered, he asked that question three times. A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for, he, for this is he of whom it is what? Written. What's he saying? There's, there's three times he asked that question. He says, Behold, I send the messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And he continues on going down through there. Part of the things that he said he's going to do is what? Give the blind sight, give the deaf hearing, and give the dumb the ability to speak. He's going to cleanse the lepers and do all that stuff. Do you know why Jesus Christ was going around healing all those people? Preparing for the kingdom. He said, You have to be, you can't be lame. You can't be blind. You can't... What are they going to have out there? What are they going to have out there in in that kingdom? No sickness. No disease. He's preparing them for that. That's exactly what he's doing. And by the way, he's also saying what? You know I am who I'm supposed to be because it's written in in the prophets. Go read your book. Go read the Bible that you have, the Old Testament canon. You can go back and you can read those things and see, I am the one that the Scripture is speaking about. He does that over and over again. What he's talking about here is within this nation of Israel, you've also got Sadducees and Pharisees and all that stuff. Go to Matthew chapter 3 real quick. This is one of those things when we think about this, you know, you've got all the religious folks back here that are blinded already. All right? And here, here's you some proof of it. Matthew chapter 3. By the way, start off in verse 1. The verses that we just read, that Jesus Christ quoted, they're right here being quoted as well in Matthew chapter 3. Notice in verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does he say, Repent ye, because Jesus Christ is going to die for your sins, get buried, and raise again three days later? The answer is no. He's saying there's a kingdom coming that's been prophesied and spoken of since the world began. And it's at hand. For this is he that was spoken of the of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Talks about the stuff that he's wearing. Down to verse 6 he says, And were baptized of him, talking about John, in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? <clears throat> who knew about the wrath to come? People that were studying the, the scriptures. What's he saying to the religious people? You're part of the blind that's not going to get in. Who's warned you? Who told you about this wrath? Who has it told you you need to flee from the wrath to come? Why? Because they were blind and they were dull of hearing. 
It was a judgment on that religious group of people. Then we've got this blinding that takes place over here of the rest of the nation of Israel, that unbelieving unbelieving Israel. Um, go get Luke. Um, get Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 4. chapter 1 um, let's start in start in verse 62 Luke chapter 1 First, the first few verses here before this in verse 57 and 61, we see that John the Baptist is born. He's circumcised according to the law of circumcision that they had. Verse 62, And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed and he spake and praised God. By the way, John's father couldn't talk God supernaturally held his tongue to where he couldn't speak and right here that's why he has to write down what the name of the child should be called and it says and his mouth was opened immediately and the tongue and his tongue loosed and he spake and praised God there's a reason that he did that and for time's sake we won't go over that today but we might I'd like to be able to do that sometime um We'll take a look at that. Notice verse 65. And fear came on all that d- that dwell around about them, and these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard him laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. He's talking about the nation of Israel, right? And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, notice, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. If you drop down to verse uh, 74, that we... That, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. He's talking about a physical salvation where they're saved from the people that hate them. And what he's dealing with there is notice he's saying, these are things that have been spoken of since the world began. All right? <clears throat> Chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> verse 14. This is shortly after. If you look in the first few verses, it's the temptation of Christ that we can match up to Matthew chapter 4 when Christ is taken in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, and then he's tempted of Satan. We come down to verse 14. Notice it says... And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him uh, through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written. The Lord, or the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were there, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. If we go back and read Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, and compare that to what he's saying here, there's a, there's a point. In fact, let's do that real quick. Isaiah 61. <clears throat> There's something really interesting that, that, that Jesus Christ does here that a lot of people miss, unfortunately. <clears throat> huh? 1, 2, 3, and 4. So Isaiah 61. Huh? Yeah. You get Psalm and Proverbs and Isaiah. Isaiah 61. Verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord... That's where he stopped. He stops in the middle of verse 2. And he says what? This day, these scriptures are fulfilled, right? He says, <clears throat> This day is this scripture fulfilled in your, in your ears. Where does he stop? He stops right before the and, right? What what is it that he's that he that he stopped at? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all them or all that mourn. The day of vengeance is over here. He says, everything that I just got through reading has taken place and it's being fulfilled right now in your ear. It's been fulfilled. And he stops right before he gets to that part. Why does he stop in the middle of a verse? Has that day of vengeance and the comfort of all mourning, has that taken place? The answer is no. That's in the future. Jesus Christ himself rightly divides the word of truth and says, this stuff's been fulfilled, and he stopped. It's a timing thing. The other thing's not taken place yet. The issue that he's shown here is, I've come to heal the blind, let the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, I'm cleansing the lepers, I'm doing all this stuff to show you all and, and give you all the sign that I am the Messiah and you need to follow me. And what do they do? They don't. A lot of them don't. In fact, later on in his ministry, the reason that he didn't tell those people, the other reason that he tell, told those people not to go tell people, because he knows he's getting ready to go die. He knows that that's in his future. Go back to Romans chapter 11. (laughs) 
So when, when we get here to Romans chapter 11, verse 7, he says, What then Israel hath obtained, that which he seeketh for, hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So we see what's going on there. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And he's saying, from that time all the way up until I'm starting to write in Romans, in Acts chapter 19 and 20, it's still going on. Here's the thing. Like I said, that 144,000, they're going to pick up where these guys left off. And you know what's going to take place? Blind people's going to see. Deaf people's going to hear. All that stuff. They're going to pick up right where they left off during that tribulation period. That's an amazing thing to think about. Why? Because God's put on pause that prophecy and he's going to pick up with it the issue here is he's not done with Israel he's not done away with their program he's not given them all the all the cursings and given the church the body of Christ all the blessings he's not done that we're not spiritual Israel we're not replacement Israel we're a completely totally different group of people than Israel ever could have been That's what he's dealing with here. <clears throat> is he's setting that up saying, this is why those people were blinded. And the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is what's going what's to get them to see again. Now there will be still some that are going to be blind after us. And that's what those 144,000 are going to be able to take care of. We won't be here to see that stuff, but man, it would be amazing to see it. I mean, you think about that seven years, what that's going to be like, the mess it's going to be. But then at the same time, God's still doing stuff. And it's going to be amazing to see the stuff that he does do. But we see here, as it's written, God hath given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, even unto this day. It was taking place way back here. I don't know. There's ideas that we might be able to, that we might be able to watch as it unfolds. I'm not sure. Um, I've heard people say that, yeah, we'll be able to, to witness it. I'm not really sure yet. I was going to say you might not want to. Well, I mean, here's the thing, too. I mean, well, oh, yeah, I mean, that would be cool. Because, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ and we're, we're judged for the work that we do with the truth that we have at the judgment seat of Christ, when we, when we think about what's going to take place there, and after that, Jesus Christ is going to go and present us to the Father, as holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And then we're going to be given positions of rank and authority in those heavenly places and get to work. Well, we might be too busy working to notice what's going on down here. Because <clears throat> Satan and his angels are going to be kicked out of those positions. It's just it's amazing stuff when you start thinking about it. Um, we'll get to talk about that someday. It's on my list. I don't know if I've gotten any of those things I've said we're going to get to one day. Um, yeah. Well, I think we have. We've gotten quite a few of them. Um, but it's one of those things. Actually, I got to thinking about this the other night. So when we get to the olive tree down here in verse 16, um, we'll probably do the four trees that we talked about a long time ago that I don't know if it ever got recorded or not or it messed up one of those. So we'll get to talk about the four trees again in Genesis.
what those four trees mean. I can't remember if that actually recorded. Yeah, the vine, the bramble, and the tree of life, and all that stuff, tree of knowledge, good and evil, and all that. We'll talk about those before we get to that. But we've got to get to this other stuff first. The reconciling of the world. The stumbling and fall. But I mean, does that does that make sense? What we're dealing with with the blinding of the nation of Israel and the purpose of what's going on with that. Because um, that's, that's what Paul is dealing with. Is this group down here has been blinded. They have an opportunity still of salvation. They're not going to believe the gospel of the kingdom, they've got to believe the gospel of the grace of God just like you and I do. They have to be They have to be saved. In order for them to be saved, they have to be saved the same way that we are. I have a very random question. All right. Um, remember the tree of tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil was a grapevine tree, right? Yeah. The vine tree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We'll have to talk about the maybe. Speaking speaking of which, I I didn't I didn't know this until the other day in. In Revelation, it talks about the the book of life being opened up. In the ESV, it's the tree of life opened up. But then a little bit later, it says the book of life again in the ESV. So you've got a tree that's also a book. That doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, well, that's what some that's what somebody said. But trees to paper, paper to binding, binding to book, written down. So, no, I don't know about that. But it's, it's 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 an interesting thing that in the King James it's Book of Life both times. In the ESV it's Tree of Life and the Book of Life. It's an interesting yeah, subject. We could. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did a. I did a few, not a lot, but it. The dramatic effect is when I say, okay, in the in the NIV, let's read this verse. And then I say, we just read it because it's not there. I, I mean, the last, what, 12 verses or so of, of Mark 16 are deleted in the NIV? Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Or they'll have it in there, but then there will be a footnote at the bottom saying it shouldn't be in there. Yeah. I mean, you look at that, and then you, you, you get the idea of how Satan subtly worked. He questioned God's word, added to it, subtracted from it, watered it down, changed words to where it didn't mean the same, and then just completely denied the Bible um, in the very beginning. I mean, that was Genesis 3. That was in the garden. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, when you start looking at whole verses missing and passages missing, I mean, there's chapters. That are, I mean, it's just, when you see that stuff, you're like, man, how in the world do we actually have a, how can we trust the Bible that we have? And so, I mean, we could we could go through that sometime. I've, we've done some videos on it, but yeah, we could we could do that sometime. It, it's really it's really kind of scary when you start seeing some of that stuff. I, f- I found at school in the teacher's workroom, I found a parallel Bible that had four versions in it. 
and I took it and I put it in my desk drawer. And so I've got it in my desk drawer at school. Well, it's just the New Testament. Yeah, it's just the New Testament, all four. Now, it's not real tiny. I mean, it's actually it's pretty good paper, actually. Um, I just don't want anybody else to see it. So that's why I took it and hid it in my, in my desk drawer. But then I'll pull it out every once in a while when a kid comes up and is like, ESV is the best reading. All right, let's compare these. Well, the NIV is better. All right, let's compare these. Oh, there's way more than that. Is there more than that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, you even get into the New King James. There's stuff there that's that's missing. Because it came from the same manuscripts as the, as the others. Yeah. yeah. It did. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean. It is. Well, I mean, yeah. But I mean, you think about that. When NIV, ESV, all those other versions, where they originated from, the original manuscripts that they came from, which weren't original manuscripts, those manuscripts that they came from, they found them in a in, in a trash can. In Egypt. In Egypt. All right. What do we know about Egypt in the Bible? It's a picture of the Antichrist is what it is. The version that's been translated that we have in the King James came from Antioch. Well, what do we know about Antioch? That was the first place they were called Christians. Now, which 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 line of manuscript do you want? The one that came from Egypt, or the one that came from Antioch? Antioch. I mean, that's where Paul started off. You know, you think about those things. We might be splitting hairs, but their hairs need to be split. Yeah, um, and it's an important thing, especially when you got to when you take the gospel and say instead of this is the gospel by which you are saved to the gospel by which you are being saved. Is is there a difference between being saved and saved? One's a process. If I'm being saved, then there's some sort of process that's involved. The other one is, I've got it. Basically. Basically. You, you've got... <laughs> It's something that you work at continuously that you have to do this or that or, you know, go to confession and say this many Hail Marys and this many Our, Our Fathers. And By the way, do you know, <clears throat> I thought of this the other day, you know, it's not, not only is it improper to, to pray the Our Father prayer, but it's, it's not even spiritually possible to be able to, our Father which art in heaven. Where's God the Father residing right now? In us. So why would we say our Father which art in heaven when he's in us? Now does that say he's not in heaven? No. But where is he? He's in the believer. He's in the He's in the soul and the mind and the heart of the believer right now. The, the, the Son of God lives within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Not only that, but we're in God, we're in Christ, we're in the Holy Spirit. I mean, you've got the, the Trinity living in you, and you've got the, you're in the Trinity. I mean, that's a pretty good sandwich to be in. And you can't get out. So then why would I say, our Father which art in heaven when he's in me? Just a thought. Not that you can't say that, but I'm just saying, you know, you think about it, <clears throat> wouldn't even make sense to, to pray that. <clears throat> but, no, I'd like to be able to do that sometime if we could, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You, you wouldn't say that he's not there. Um, <clears throat> that, that's why I said I wouldn't say, well, you can't say that. But, I mean, at that time, 
he wasn't in them. The only place he was was in heaven. And it's going to be the same thing. The idea that is, is when he says, um, give us this day our daily bread, he's going to feed them daily through the tribulation period. And when they say, forgive us our sins as, as we forgive those who trespass against us, well then, what do we know about them? They don't have forgiveness of sins yet. When do they get it? At the when, when Jesus Christ comes back. So that's why they pray that. They didn't. They don't. They didn't have that at that time. We actually have forgiveness of all sins right now as a present possession. We're not waiting on it. Yeah, I mean, people say it all the time, and, and that's fine. But I mean, is that is that praying a prayer of faith? Or just repeating something. By the way, which is funny because in the context he says, don't be like the the heathen and all that, saying repeating the prayers. <laughs> it's the most repeated prayer in, in, in Scripture. That that and the sinner's prayer. Uh, but I mean, you think about those things and you start, what, what Bible study does, proper Bible study, what proper sound doctrine does is get you to think of those things and think, why am, I, why am I doing this? I don't have to, you know. Uh, it's, it's just it's it's liberating, is what it is, and it's the liberty that we have that we're able to do that. Um, but any questions? Any more questions or comments? I appreciate those. I really do. Um, as far as what they believe. Um, I'm not totally 100% sure what Methodists believe. However, Methodists, it's a rejection of Calvinism is what it is. That was the purpose that it was created was to, was to reject what Calvin taught, which is um, predestination, which is everybody, everybody that's saved is because God saved them and you didn't have a choice in the matter or not. It wasn't a choice that you made to be saved or a choice to stay lost. Uh, God chose for you that you were going to be saved or lost. And that. Uh, so really, Methodists, their original stance was a refuting of Calvinism. Um, now where that is today, it's not so much that anymore. Um <clears throat> I do, I do know uh, that they do baptize now for salvation or not. I'm not sure. Um, there's, there. I think they teach that. Um, and like I said, I don't know everything about it, but um, if I if I'm if I remember correctly, not well. I probably shouldn't say. I probably shouldn't say it if I don't know for sure, but I know for a fact it was it originated as a, um, a rejection of, of Calvinism. And I'm sure you have talked to the party in Christmas a few times. Students ask you, but like, what is the difference about going out murdering or whatever? Mm-hmm. What was your answer all that again? Well, the what keeps me from doing that is knowing what His grace has actually done. Grace teaches us not to do that stuff. Um, if if I give you the opportunity, and like I said, God takes God takes a chance at His grace being taken advantage of every day. Um, for instance, with 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 your little girl, one day you might say, "Well, you can't go to you can't drive to this place or whatever." All right. Um, <clears throat> That's you saying you can't do this. There, there's some sort of, of, of rule or a law or something that you said that you can't do this. Um, <clears throat> where otherwise you could say, I've taught you enough that you know not to go there. So that's the difference in, <clears throat> I don't have to be told not to murder somebody because I know that God set me free not to, not to do this. So I make the choice not to do that, which is the whole idea between, behind Calvinism is, if God's really ordering every step that you take, then he's the one that makes you murder somebody if you murder somebody, which is not true. 
And what he does is the grace teaches you not to do those things. Now, is it possible to still do those? Absolutely. Um, Because we still have that sinful nature in us until that's taken away uh, at the rapture and that's done away with. Um, But when when you really truly know and understand what grace has done for you, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and then it's not an issue of if I do it or not. But is it, if if I do that, does that mean I'm lost? No. Because if I've already been forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future, God would be unrighteous in judging me for something that he's already judged his son for for me, if that makes sense. But it, it, what it comes down to is, is I don't do that because I understand what grace... I, I know what took place on the cross for me, and I'm going to choose not to go murder somebody because I know that's not who I am. That's not who God's made me to be. He's set me free from all that stuff, and it's it's the choice is what it comes down to. The So, um, this is what I would tell you to do. It, the very first thing, yeah. Um, here, here's two things you can tell him. You can write this down too. Ephesians 4:32 and Colossians 2:13. All right. And this is this is where you know the whole evangelism training stuff that we're doing and going through that. <coughs> This is where things like this come in, 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 into importance because have him actually read Ephesians 4.32 and have him actually read Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Let him decide if he's going to believe what the Word actually says because in Ephesians 4.32, he says, And be ye kind to one, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Hath is past tense. Forgiven is it's done. When you're saved, you're forgiven of all sins. And he's forgiven you um, all sin. How do we get it that it's all? Colossians 2.13. He says, And you being dead in your sins, which means that you're, you're that, that baptism that we talked about a few weeks ago, when we're placed into living union with Christ, his his death is our death. His burial is our burial. His resurrection is our resurrection. And that's what he's talking about here. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Not some, but all. So then it comes down to, does he believe those two verses? Um, which is why it's important because we go back and like I said before, we go back into Matthew chapter 6, it's you have to forgive in order to be forgiven. And if you don't forgive people, then God won't forgive you. Well, what do we know about Matthew chapter 6? Jesus Christ was sent to who? The nation of Israel. Who's, who's Paul writing to in Ephesians and Colossians is you and I. That's not to us. We read that and say, Bless God, thank Him that I've been forgiven. I don't have to forgive people to get it. I've already been given it. And that's what makes me want to forgive other people. And it's that choice of, as an adult, I choose to forgive somebody because I've already been forgiven. Especially if they're a a saved person because God's already forgiven them. How can I hold something against you when the Creator of heaven and earth won't hold it against you? And so that's why I say, have him read those two verses and say, well, what do you think about those two verses? And if he doesn't agree with it, well, then he's not disagreeing with you or with me or anybody here. He's disagreeing with what the book says. And that's what it has to come down to is that book. 
because that's the issue, which is why we care that which version it is and words on the page, which is why we care about the words on the page. Um, because that's the issue. Not what I say, not what anybody else says. I mean, my my idea and hope would be that if I died today, you all could you all have enough information that you can keep on doing stuff yourself. You know, and that that's the purpose of it that 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 we're able to do that, and that's why we put these up on Facebook and YouTube so people can come back and watch and things like that. So, um, but no, that's good that you're talking to him. And that's always going to be the first response. You could even take him back <clears throat> over to Romans where it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God's answer is God forbid. That's his answer to it. No, don't don't keep sinning so that grace can abound. Stop sinning. That's what Romans chapter 7 is all about is quit doing it. Grow up and stop doing the things that you know you're not supposed to do. Uh, and that's the difference between a child and an adult. A child does what they're supposed to because they're told to. An adult does what they what they're supposed to because they choose to. And that's that's the difference between that. <clears throat> but now that's a great question. Um, I really wish I had something else about Methodist Church, but I don't want to say stuff just in case I'm wrong. Because um, I know some of the things they teach, but I don't want to say it because I'm not 100% correct. But I do know it's it's rejection of Calvinism. Um, and I think they do teach you can lose your salvation and um, things like that. But I don't want to say too much just in case. So. Um, when you say important, what do you mean important? Yeah, which is true. Well, and that, that's the thing. I mean, what do we know about the law? The purpose of the law was what? To show that you can't do it. It's a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. That's the purpose of it. Um, so, do do I think do I do I think highly of the Ten Commandments or the other 403 that are that are along with it? Because most people forget about the 403, which doesn't make sense because there's more there than the ten. But the ten are the one that everybody kind of holds up in reverence. Um, <clears throat> but the purpose of the law is to bring you to Christ to show you you can't do it. I mean, right now, if you went home, <clears throat> have you all made lunch yet today? Are you going to when you go home? All right. So as soon as you do that, you've broken a commandment. Well, even then, you're not allowed to light a fire. You're not allowed to be able to do anything like that. You're not supposed to do any work at all whatsoever. Um, which actually, the Sabbath was on a Saturday, not on a Sunday. So that's a whole other mess. But I mean, it's a, it, it's a thing that brings you to Christ to let you know, you know what? Where it says in Romans three that I've missed the mark, and that I'm I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I'm I am because I can't do any of these. No, that was uh, <clears throat> that was the religious people trying to say that he was healing people on the Sabbath. Um, there's nothing there's nothing against that. That was a the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the religious folks, the ones that were blind from the very beginning, basically. Um, that was them trying to catch him in a lie. Um, yeah, yeah. If he wasn't, then. We have no choice but to keep the commandments even now yet and go, I mean, every one of us would have to have some sort of animal that we'd have to sacrifice to had he had he sinned at all. Uh, if he wasn't perfect and blameless and sinless and righteous, then why would I want his righteousness if he's not righteous? He's If he was just as righteous as I am. Because, I mean, in James, he, it says, if you break any the one of the least of these commandments, you're guilty of all. So if he broke one, then he was guilty of all four, 600, 600, 413. Is it 613? Anyway, I think it's 613. Um, <coughs> but I mean, that's one of those things. If he messed up one, 
he's guilty of all of them. And then he can't be my propitiation. And when God says in Romans 3 that his faith believes that Christ was a fully satisfying payment, then he knows that Christ did, didn't sin. That was, that was a religious group of people trying to get him caught up, just like it is today. I mean, that's really what that question comes from is, well, what if I murder somebody? That's what that is, is a religious religious system trying to catch you up in something and make it. That's exactly what it is. <coughs> uh, yeah, which is why they always go to murder. I mean, <coughs> murder murder's the same as if you lie. It's the exact same. They're all they're all the same. Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I'd rather feel bad that you lied to me than you know not being able to breathe. So then, who is it all the same? God. God. And who make who makes the separation and divisions between them is is people. Well, we murder is worse than this. According to who? You. As soon as now you're my authority. And you get to control me. And that's that's exactly what churches do. Um, they're all the same in the eyes of God. That's why he says there's none righteous, no, not one. Because if you mess up one, you mess up them all. It's the same. That's the way he looks at it. <clears throat> but, yeah. No, those are good questions. Those are good questions. Is there another one? There? Yeah, there. Right down here. Oh, okay. thought maybe she was thinking of a question. Um but I mean, those are good questions because that's that's the attack that grace has, and it's always been that way. I mean, Paul dealt with it. That's why he says, "Some people say that I teach this. Some people say that Paul taught you can go do whatever you want to." And he says that's not what it is. And he says other people even affirm that I've said that, and he's not. Um, but I mean, that that's the thing because it's always going to be brought up. Well, if you teach people to live by grace, then you're just going to teach people that it's okay to sin, and it's not okay to sin. Because me sinning is what sent him to the cross. So why would I want to? If I know that's what he died for, why would I want to? It all goes back to, yeah, it goes back to the God forbid. If God says don't do that because that's what sent his son there, I can choose to not do it or to do it. Um, I mean, Paul even says whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. So if just not believing God's word, for instance, those two verses I gave you, if you don't believe those two verses, that's the same, that's the sin just as much as murder is, just as much as lying is, such as, as much as not keeping, the, I mean, all those. Um, <clears throat> it's the same. Because... It, Faith is faith is taking God at his word. And if we don't, then he calls that sin. And it's just the same as everything else. But <clears throat> Are you comfortable? Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> But no, those are great. Those are great questions. I appreciate those. Any questions out there in Facebook world, Delilah? Okay. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Um, anything else? So, when people ask that question, what that be like a good counter argument to say, well, I mean, technically God says that if you've done one, you've done them all. So, if you've lied, technically. Yeah. No, that no, that would be because I mean that that's the way he looks at it. Um, and the thing about it is, who cares which one you do? Because guess what? He's already declared us that we're 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 dead in, in our sins anyway. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. We've all missed it. So that's his thought process. Is I've already declared you you've missed it. And so what happens then is, all right, so not only have you missed it, but I've made a way for you to actually get saved and have righteousness. And it's not righteousness that you do, but it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And 
I'd rather have his than mine any day. Um, so then it comes to, all right, I know what he did. Why would I want to do anything else? Why would I want to go and, and murder? Um, but the thing is, is if I do lie, what do I know about that sin? It's already been paid for and forgiven. Do you know what that makes me think of? I'm thankful that God has already forgiven me of a lie that I'll say next week. I'm thankful that God's already get forgiven me of something I'm going to do this afternoon when Kansas plays Duke and might get beat. I might throw some something, maybe a cat. I don't know. I won't. But I mean, <clears throat> isn't that liberating to think about? I'm already forgiven. Now, is that going to change the way that I act? Should. Right? I mean, that's that's the thing. Am I still going to do? Am I still going to mess up? Absolutely. But when I do that, do I feel sorry for myself and beat myself down even more? Well, I've already been forgiven. All right. Thank God for that. So what am I going to do the next time that same situation comes up? I don't do the same thing. Huh? You try not to do it. That's the point. That's what Paul. That's what all Romans chapter seven is about. Where he goes through and says, that what I want to do, I don't do. But that I don't want to do, I do it because sin lives in me. And we know that we're going to have to live and deal with sin for the rest of our lives until this body is taken and changed and given that glorious body. So I know I'm going to have to deal with that. Well, I already know that God's dealt with every one of those sins at the cross. I mean, he died, he died before I did any of them. Uh, and that's an amazing thing to think about. Um, but that's what grace does is it teaches us not to do those things. Because if I know that I'm already forgiven, wouldn't that make me want to not do those anymore? I mean, like I said, everybody always goes to murder. They say, if you believe, if I believe the way you did, I'd go murder people. No, if you believe the way I did, you get in your Bible and you study it and find out who God's made you in Christ. That's what you do if you believe the way I do. A lot of people that don't, a lot of people that believe the once saved, always saved, they don't know that. They don't know who they've been made in Christ. That's the difference. They don't have an answer for that. Because it's, well, God will forgive you if you ask for forgiveness. That's their answer. No, he's already forgiven you. So quit doing it. It's a choice. Be an adult. And that's what it comes down to. And that's what he's looking for, sons of God. <coughs> Adult children of God, that's what he's looking for. And when this doctrine gets a hold of you, that's what it'll do. It'll, I mean, <clears throat> when, you, when, you start, when you start getting this stuff and it makes sense and you apply it, you look back two, three years from now, two, three years... You look back to today, you're like, man, I don't even recognize myself. I mean, I still mess up, but I still see I'm different than I was five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. I mean, it 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 changes it changes you uh, in ways that you don't even know yet <clears throat> when you actually just trust the words on the page. That's what it comes down to. Um, it's the word of God which effectually worketh in you that believe. Just reading it doesn't make you change. Believing it and applying it makes you change. Um, that's an amazing thing because it's not even you making yourself change. It's God's word doing it for you. And it's God doing it. It's just, it's amazing when you see that. Um, like I said, I still have things in my life I know I've got to take care of. But I know God's not holding it against me. And that just makes it easier to make that decision next time not to.
should be about eight amens there, and everybody's all sad looking. <clears throat> no. But, I mean, it, that that's the thing. That's the thing. That's the difference in when you actually study it. Um, instead of just going and make yourself feel good for a week or a, a day or two from hearing some inspirational message. I mean, that book is life. Me, me speaking the message. It's nothing if it's not the book. The books, the books, what brings life? Not me or anybody else standing up here. The words on the page is what brings life. And I just want to be a helper of your joy. Help you move along in that. <clears throat> All right. Anything else? Questions? No, you're not allowed to ask anything. You heard me. <laughs> no, good questions. Good stuff. Good stuff. I appreciate it. All right. So we'll go ahead and end off with a word of prayer. We'll get through Romans 11. We'll start getting down through. I, I think I want to talk about the, the snare and the trap, the stumbling block, the table, all that stuff next time. I think we've covered... 11 and 12 really well, but I want to make sure that we get that, bless you, with their stumbling, falling, and diminishing stuff, so, <clears throat> good deal, next Sunday is Easter, isn't it, huh, pastel suits and ties, yes, <clears throat> with the top hat and the cane, all right, Let's close off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we allow your word to be the final issue and the final authority in everything that we think, say, do, everything that we hear. Let your word be the issue. Because we know it's your word that works in us when we actually trust in the words on the page. And we know that it's you working through us and in us as we build up that doctrine in our life and soul that we not only know how to present the gospel clearly to people, but we know how to live the gospel that people may know, that they can also have the life that you have already prepared for us, that you've, that you've created us in Christ Jesus unto good works, that we should walk in them. We thank you for the word. We thank you for all that you've done for us through your son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>